Um, as I say, it's, very, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, Aquinas will be explicitly mentioned near the end of the paper, but I'm hoping not to really mention him um, along the way explicitly. But if you're familiar with Aquinas, I think you won't find what I say here foreign to what you're familiar with. So I'm here to talk to you today about whether or not there are failed human persons. I'm not going to stand over here, by the way, because the moment you're here, that light is is right in your face. So I'm sorry if I'm behind here because it seems like it'd be awkward if I was way over here. So um, I'm here to talk to you today about whether or not there are failed human persons. I definitely think there are failed human persons. However, before explaining why I think there are failed persons and who they might be, I think it will be good to look a little bit at our society to get a sense of what it thinks a failed human person is. Its notion of a failed person is quite different from mine. It is important in particular for those of you who are already in or will enter into the medical profession, if there are any are here, and related fields to take a look at this societal notion of a failed person, but also for those of you generally who care about how we think about and administer medicine. What's good about it and what might be bad about it? It's important since there are growing movements here and abroad aimed at killing by medical means human beings who are judged in some sense to be failed persons. Human beings who do not count as persons according to this societal notion. The question for all of us who live within this society with its notion of failed persons is whether we will take part in and support this movement toward killing human beings or avoid it. Indeed, whether we will push back against it. This killing of human beings isn't simply confined to abortion as it has been legally available here in the United States for almost 50 years now. Recent political discussions have made it clear that some leaders think such killing ought to be allowed all the way up until birth and perhaps after. Indeed, very recently there was an article in a mainstream bioethics journal arguing that infanticide should be renamed post-birth abortion. This article was not about the moral legitimacy of either infanticide or abortion. The article was not, uh, the moral legitimacy of those acts was taken as a given by the authors. It was an argument about the social impact of words. The authors took it for granted that there's no rational distinction to be drawn between abortion and infanticide, particularly late-term abortion. However, the word infanticide suffers social stigma for historical reasons, where the word abortion does not. So infanticide should be called post-birth abortion so that those who engage in it will not suffer social stigma. There's also the moral acceptance, philosophical defense, and increasing legalization of medically assisted euthanasia of human beings who on the societal notion do not count as persons. One can also consider the often tacit social, even state-sponsored eugenic pressure upon women to kill unborn human beings judged to be undesirable according to some prenatally diagnosable condition, particularly Down syndrome, but soon many others as well. The future of non-invasive prenatal genetic testing will soon enough be able to diagnose thousands of genetic abnormalities, all of them potentially providing a reason for societal and state-sponsored eugenic pressure to kill. I want to argue that often explicitly and other, at other times implicitly, the justification for this growth of medically assisted killing relies upon a confused and indefensible notion of failed persons. So I'd like to begin here with that societal notion in order to try to discover what a clear and defensible notion of fail, failed persons might be a notion that does not allow for killing human beings, but suggests something rather startlingly different about our relationship to one another as human beings. Allow me to begin with the Washington Post, surely a beacon of mainstream as well as elite social attitudes. I'd like you to consider a curious confluence of two opinion columns that appeared over two consecutive days in March of 2018. The first was by Mark Thiessen, a political conservative. It took note of the awful rates of abortion of children prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome in places like Iceland, practically 100%, percent 
Denmark, 98%, and the United States, roughly 67%, although that varies higher um, depending on where you are in the country. He did not mention, although he could have, that Denmark has announced as a state-sponsored policy goal the elimination of Down syndrome by the year 2030 through the practice of universal prenatal testing and abortion. I hope you can see the oddity of the claim that one might eliminate Down syndrome by abortion. In the first place, such a cure of the condition lasts only so long as no other woman conceives a child with an extra 21st chromosome, and then what was, then, and then what was cured or eliminated must be cured or eliminated again. And of course, as my wife, who speaks on this tof topic, often says, Down syndrome seems to be, the one, be one of the only medical conditions cured not by addressing the pathology as a means to assisting the patient who suffers from it, but by killing the patient who suffers from it as a means to getting rid of the pathology. Imagine if a similarly state-sponsored program were directed at the cure of the much more widespread disease of hypertension by the killing of human beings with a genetic predisposition to it. The difference, of course, is that hypertension is genetically inherited, while Down syndrome is not. So theoretically, one could eliminate a gene for hypertension in the gene pool by killing all those with it, while Down syndrome will only be eliminated for a day, a week, or a month, and then have to be cured all over again. In any case, Thiessen asked, when will we stop killing human beings with Down syndrome? That's a very good and important question. However, his focus was upon the achievements of people with Down syndrome that we see reported in the news. Achievements like Karen Gaffney swimming the English Channel, others modeling clothing for department stores, or Lucas Warren being named the Gerber baby a couple of years ago. Noting all these achievements, Thiessen argued that these human beings ought to be valued and included within our society rather than killed. The message seemed to be that they ought to be valued because of what they can achieve, that we as a society find valuable. The very next day, Ruth Marcus, a political liberal, took the opposite position as she wrote a column unapologetically, indeed proudly entitled, I would have aborted a fetus with Down syndrome. Women need that right. She took note of the diminished cognitive capacities and increased health problems that often accompany Down syndrome, as well as the lowered expectations we can have for what such people can achieve. Within five sentences, she flatly contradicted herself, writing first that, certainly to be a parent is to take the risks that accompany parenting. You love your child for who she is, not what you want her to be. That statement seems to run counter to the picture presented by Thiessen, in which we seem to value human beings in terms of what we think they can achieve, that we find valuable as a society, very much what we want out of them. But then, after three sentences describing the difficulties associated with Down syndrome, and presumably imagining a child of hers receiving a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome, Marcus wrote, I'm going to be blunt here. That was not the child I wanted. So it is, after all, despite what she had claimed, that loving the child or killing her depends upon what we want her to be. Indeed, one suspects in Marcus's case a kind of cheap grace in affirming the love of your child for who she is rather than what you want her to be, so long as you did, in fact, get what you wanted in having her. I want to be fair to Thiessen. For all I know, he is in general opposed to abortion. He may simply have thought that pointing out what human beings with Down syndrome can achieve was rhetorically powerful, given his audience in the Washington Post. But if a, rhetoric, but if a rhetorical strategy, it simply underscores all the more the point I'm trying to make. Why would he think that rhetorical strategy effective? That, rhetor that rhetoric is all too familiar when it comes to Down syndrome. Given everything human beings with Down syndrome can achieve, it's a tragedy that so many are aborted and never have the chance to surprise us with their accomplishments. However, sometimes adopting a rhetorical strategy does nothing other than fundamentally reaffirm the social context that is, in fact, the root problem. 
our valorization of other human beings for what they achieve and associating their worth or dignity with what we value, what we want in ourselves and in those with whom we are willing to associate. So, while I welcome Thiessen's conclusion that we should stop aborting children with Down syndrome, he and Marcus appear to share an underlying assumption about human value, namely that how we ought to treat other human beings, particularly in the context of a societal argument about whether or not to kill them, depends upon what we can expect from them in terms of their capacities for achievements that we value. Summarizing this societal context, we can speak of a community of moral concern or value. The community of moral concern consists of those human beings whom we think we have moral obligations towards and responsibility for. The very practical question for a society that kills human beings is who is a member of that community of moral concern and who is not. How is the boundary drawn between those human beings that may not be killed and those that may? and why. It is here that the notion of person often comes into play, particularly in the field of bioethics. In bioethics, the boundary is most often drawn between those human beings who are considered persons and those human beings who fail to be persons. This is not an uncommon approach to the question of human value, as if confined to the technic technicalities of bioethical questions. In both contemporary culture and philosophy, the term person is often used to mark out the community of human beings who have rights that must be respected. Human beings whom we think we should care for but by providing them with enough to eat, with shelter, education, health care, kept safe from crime and poverty. Failure to provide for these things is often thought to be an offense against human dignity. But as many cultural writers and philosophers have pointed out, the notion of human dignity just seems to be a catchphrase for the notion of personhood. Who counts as a person and who does not? Who fails to be a person and who does not? In that discussion, almost everyone who engages in it agrees that not all human beings are persons. Some human beings fail to be persons. Such non-person human beings bear no rights and may in particular be killed without the question of justice ever arising for or about them. So the term person serves functionally to demarcate the community of moral concern. Those human beings who have dignity and rights that cannot be justly violated, those human beings towards whom we have obligations. Now I want to explore for a while the content of this cultural philosophical concept of a person. Think of what people mean when they say someone very old who suffers from the extremes of dementia or some debilitating disease or condition often referred to as a persistent vegetative state. Often one hears people say, that isn't the person I knew. The person I knew and loved is gone. They seem to be saying that, human that the human being with whom I lived a life, who engaged me in various different ways having to do with ordinary cognitive and volitional functioning, speaking with me, playing with me, eating with me, perhaps making love with me, raising children with me, no longer does so and is incapable of doing so. Here again, near the end of life, rather than the beginning, the human being is judged to be a person by what he or she does or does not achieve in relationship to what we value in life, what we want out of the relationship. I want to call this notion of personhood a social psychological notion of personhood. It is psychological because it tends to emphasize the manifestation of cognitive and volitional capacities in human action. It involves the ready capacity to express cognitive and volitional acts. It is social because first, it tends to emphasize the ways in which the human being engages other human beings through those cognitive and volitional capacities, and second, because it emphasizes expressions of cognitive and volitional capacities that the community of moral concern finds valuable. So there's a kind of distinction to be made between, on the one hand, what we might call the metaphysical question of when a human being is or becomes a person related to the presence of healthy cognitive and volitional capacities, and on the other hand, the moral significance placed upon these psychological capacities determined by various social activities or attitudes towards them. 
as well as their relative strength and health. How healthy and strong must those capacities be, as manifested to us, to count for determining the circle of moral concern, the circle of human persons versus the circle of failed human persons? Think of yourselves listening to me now, and think of me speaking to you now as social psychological persons, exhibiting significant capacities for reason and will. But the example could just as well be eating dinner with one another or playing football. On this social psychological notion of being a person, a human being is a person only if he or she can readily exhibit a certain level of performance with respect to normal human activities characterized by reason and will. The Washington Post columnists seem to assume this notion of person. Despite their disagreement about aborting prenatally diagnosed children with Down syndrome, they both seem to share the assumption that the case ought to be decided on the basis of what human beings with Down syndrome perform amongst us in terms of various activities that we value. There's a social psychological bar over which they must jump to be included in the community of persons. If that is the case, there will always be human beings who fail to be persons on this social psychological criterion. Since as long as one has a bar, there will be human beings who cannot jump over it. It's fair to say that within contemporary philosophy and bioethics, arguments for the moral legitimacy of such things as abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, eugenics, are dominated by some form of this social psychological notion of a person. The most famous philosopher in the field of bioethics is undoubtedly Peter Singer of Princeton University. Here is how he argues for the infanticide of human beings born with Down syndrome in his book, Rethinking Life and Death, where presumably the imagined parents did not know until after birth that their child had Down syndrome. To have a child, To have a child with Down syndrome is to have a very different experience from having a normal child. It can still be a warm and loving experience, but we must have lowered expectations of our child's abilities. We cannot expect a child with Down syndrome to play the guitar, to develop an appreciation of science fiction, to learn a foreign language, to chat with us about the latest Woody Allen movie, places it a little bit in the early 90s, but he still holds this position. Or to be a respectable athlete, basketballer, or tennis player. I think the fact that he refers to a basketballer um, <laughs> indicates to you that he's from Australia. Singer goes on to argue that animated by this concern for the parents' well-being as seekers of children, the parents ought to be able to engage in infanticide with the assistance of the medical community in order that they may start over and try again to get the child they wanted, a child capable of performing and achieving success along these lines. They won't get that child if they are caring for this other child. Singer doesn't like to use the term person for various reasons, including the thought that it would get in the way of protecting beings with sentience rather than intelligence. However, it's clear that in this case of arguing for infanticide of human children, He's employing what others would call a notion of personhood, and that is the social psychological one, and his argument transfers easily to those discussions that do use the term person. It also trans e translates easily to the context of prenatal diagnosis, again, since he also argues that there is no rational distinction to be drawn between abortion and infanticide, um, something we might actually agree with him about. So it's hard not to think of Ruth Marcus's column in the Washington Post while reading that passage in Singer. As a matter of fact, Singer is wrong about the abilities of human beings with Down syndrome, as many can engage in these activities, the point that Thiessen emphasized. Only those who are in general ignorant of the lives of people with Down syndrome would think they cannot. But broadly, this passage of Singer's aligns with both Thiessen's and Marcus's arguments about abortion now transposed to infanticide. The case is to be determined upon the basis of performance and what parents want in and from their children. No matter that the list of achievements expresses a particularly Western and bourgeois attitude toward human excellence. Tennis? Woody Allen movies? Given this list in the United States today, one can only imagine 
How excited parents would be if their child turned out to be a French-speaking, Ursula K. Le Guin reading, Christopher Nolan watching, LeBron James. <laughs> Notice in particular the way that the social measure of human value in Singer's description shapes our understanding of the goal of medicine here. For, his way, for this way of thinking, the disease that medicine is to address is not really Down syndrome, the presence of an extra 21st chromosome in a child that has been conceived. The disease or pathology of concern to Singer calling for our moral concern is the parent's inability to produce the child they want, the child they expect to perform as they desire, to perform up to their LeBronish standards. The child is the monstrous outgrowth of that disease. The parents in conceiving such a child suffer from a pathology, the pathology of being underachieving reproducers. And it is the task of medicine to cure them of that disability, giving them another chance to succeed by first killing their bad seed. The parent's pathology is a failure to live up to their expectations of what success in reproduction looks like, expectations of their own to be sure, but that are very clearly socially conditioned. On this view of medicine, the medical profession of obstetrics is transformed into a kind of cosmetic pre and, post pre and postnatal surgery for couples. I'm not exaggerating when I say that an extraordinary amount of the philosophical discussion of personhood that takes place in contemporary secular philosophy, especially in bioethics, is in service to expanding the scope of human beings who may be killed by restricting the scope of human beings who are judged to be persons. A few years ago, I had to um, wade through the bioethics literature as part of a seminar I was in, and I was supposed to put together a bibliography, and honestly, I came out of it just depressed as hell and um, just referred to it as the um, killing fields of bioethics. It's not about whether we should or should not kill. It's how can we um, best kill in terms of a kind of moral character of killing. Now I lost my place, of course. Um, moral and political philosophers talk very little about persons except for those contexts in which the question is whether human beings may be killed without their consent. When the question of killing isn't on the table, they typically tend to talk simply about rational and autonomous individuals. But when we dig down into what is meant by a rational and autonomous individual, it turns out to be pretty much the same as an individual with the ready capacity to engage in sophisticated cognitive and volitional capacities. In that discussion, it's pretty unquestionably evident that there are human beings who are not persons and may be killed. However, I think with a little reflection, it's evident that this social, psychological criterion of person should be abandoned. One difficulty with it, even for those who advocate it, is that it allows too much killing. The bar is set too high. For example, it allows for the killing of those who are in a comatose state. Comas are not typically persistent, although they can be. But someone in a coma does not have the ready capacity to engage in sophisticated cognitive and volitional capacities. They can't speak their own language, much less, much less a foreign language, play basketball, or appreciate the darkness of a Christopher Nolan movie. Even more, there's a huge class of human beings who fail to be persons on this social psychological account. A class of human beings that dwarfs the class of the demented, the vegetative, the cognitively impaired, the sick, the blind, the halt, and the withered. That class is the class of healthy human infants who have been born but are prelinguistic. In theory, it allows for the killing of healthy human infants up until, at the latest, something roughly in the middle or later of their second year after birth, when language use begins to appear although it is not a particularly sophisticated sort. Healthy infants do not have the ready capacity to manifest sophisticated capacities for cognitive and volitional activity along the lines of Singer's criteria any more than the severely cognitively impaired do. They can't play basketball, watch Christopher Nolan movies, or read Le Guin novels. But in that case, these infants fall outside the circle of moral concern that by the social psychological criterion of personhood forbids killing human persons. They are human beings without being persons. I could go on, but I think we should simply reject this social psychological notion of personhood that enables the setting of a killing bar. 
we should either just dump the notion of personhood altogether, which I'm actually in favor of, or recognize, on the contrary, that all human beings are persons in a more fundamental sense. To see why, I want to begin by thinking about the moral obligations that we think we have toward uh, those human beings amongst us who are healthy. Much of modern moral philosophy thinks that the specific character of moral agency is encountered in our lives in rational but particularly autonomous activity. To be autonomous is to be a self-directed agent, setting one's own goals and having the rational capacity and will to achieve those goals. This emphasis upon rational autonomy is very much an element of the social psychological notion of person that I've been talking about. It does not follow that others to whom the autonomous agent relates are of no moral weight unless the agent chooses to make them so. Rational autonomy does not entail relativism about our moral obligations to others. But it is a feature of this way of thinking of the moral that the basis for our obligations towards others are a problem to be solved since, as Nietzsche argued, it's not obvious or self-evident that power attached to reason and autonomy should address the concerns of others rather than simply itself. I won't rehearse here the various attempts to solve what we might call the problem of the other in modern moral philosophy. That is, how ought the autonomous rational agent relate to others? What I want you to consider here is a less idealized and abstract perspective on the phenomenon of the moral character of our lives. I want you to notice that in reality, the specifically moral character of our lives is primarily engaged in relation to others. Whether those others are human beings, dolphins, birds, or bears. In addition, whatever ideal of autonomy is put forward by modern moral philosophy, in reality, any such autonomy is an autonomy conditioned by dependence upon others. In reality, we live our lives not as ideally autonomous agents, but as agents dependent upon and among one another, engaging one another well or badly. Some measure of autonomy might be achieved in this or that activity or context, which is a good thing depending upon the activity or context. But a realistic assessment of such autonomy will recognize the extent to which it is at the very least enabled, if not determined by our dependence upon one another. However, we should not think of our more fundamental dependence upon one another for almost everything we do as a bad thing to be overcome. That one is not a person unless one has achieved the ideal of rational autonomy proposed by modern moral philosophy, overcoming our dependence upon others. If rational autonomy is a goal and a good to be pursued by human beings, it can only be so for human beings who are already moral agents directed to and capable of pursuing such a goal, conditioned and directed to it by what they already are, human beings. We are not human persons because we have crossed some threshold of development of capacities of reason and will. We are human persons because being human, we are from the beginning of our lives set upon a course of development that includes as stages of development those capacities and many others besides. But now I want you to focus upon the fact that the specifically moral character of our lives becomes more engaged when attending to weakness rather than strength. There are all sorts of moral attitudes we take and actions we express that we do not really notice when dealing with the healthy. Smiling at a friend when she walks in the room, making dinner for one's family, answering a roommate's questions about the physics exam tomorrow, not insisting on the movie to go to this weekend, but allowing one's friend to decide for once. Attending a basketball game to watch LeBron dominate. Because these are human actions, they are moral actions, even if we do not pay much attention to them as such. But we experience ourselves much more explicitly as moral agents when confronted with weakness, when confronted with the question of whether to help or to turn away. A flight I was on recently was delayed half a day because Delta had not arranged for a pilot for the plane. 
It was a bit of a struggle, but I did my best to be pleasant to the woman at the gate, respecting her role, her advice, and so on, and thanking her as I left. It was not, after all, her fault. I didn't self-consciously experience myself as a moral agent then and there, even though I was, in fact, acting as one. Only later upon reflection did it occur to me that such a situation is both a reminder of my dependence upon others and also a context for expressing myself well or badly as a moral agent. But every time I have walked by a beggar on the streets, I have explicitly and self-consciously experienced myself as a moral agent but I, by what I do in stopping or walking by. I was recently in Kolkata, India and saw an abandoned child of maybe three years old, squatting and defecating on the side of a busy street in the midst of the commercial district. I walked by in anguish. Someone later asked me, what did you do? I had to say nothing. What could I do? The next day I walked by what looked like a dead man's body sprawled face down on the sidewalk. Again, I walked by in anguish. My anguish wasn't simply at the plight of the child, or the man who may have died as he lay in the sidewalk. It was an anguish at my own moral impotence. What could I do? My moral impotence in those circumstances amplifies my point about how we are dependent upon one another to pursue our lives. What could I do? I had no idea how I would get help in this city so foreign to me. If I pulled that child out of a street, what then? Or out of the street, what then? By the time I got close to him, he was already getting out of the street. His fundamental problem was not defecating, however awful that was, in the street, but his homelessness, which was not unique to him in that setting. It was a holiday and there were tens of thousands of Indians around having come into the city from the countryside. What would have happened to me if I, the only white person in that vast crowd, was seen picking up an Indian child and walking away with him, even if only to give him to the missionaries of charity where I was headed. These people wouldn't know that. They would see a white Westerner carrying away an Indian boy. But whom could, whom could I ask for help? How do I even ask for help? Who do I turn to to get the body of the dead man off the sidewalk and take care of, and taken care of? The police collect those dead bodies. It used to be a scheduled activity that they did every Tuesday. I found out later that now they will do it when called. How do I call the police? In all of this misery, my moral impotence was in part due to the fact that I had no one to help me to act well as the moral agent I would like to be. We aren't just dependent upon one another in times of our own physical or economic weakness, but in our pursuit of moral strength and excellence. We can't even be morally good without one another unless we close our eyes to human suffering and the need to address it. But how can we be morally good if we do close our eyes? I'm not suggesting that there's an easy answer as to what to do when you walk by a beggar. I wish I did not know that there is no easy answer when you walk by a dead body in an utterly foreign city you've only just entered into. But we need to acknowledge the way that the weakness that appears concretely before us amplifies for us our character as moral agents and calls for a response in a way that ordinary encounters with relatively stable, healthy, and strong individuals and groups do not. After all, anyone who sits on the street begging for money is suffering from some sort of weakness, even if in a particular case, as sometimes happens, it is not the weakness of financial poverty. My point is not simply a subjective point about the experience of the moral in our lives, being heightened in engaging weakness and suffering. I think you'll agree that it's about the reality of the moral in our lives, not our experience of it that matters. That reality of the moral comes out most strongly in the ways in which we encounter those who, are, who need our aid, the weak, the impaired, the hungry, the stranger looking for help, and the dying. It's precisely the depth of the moral character of our life in the circumstance of encountering weakness that draws the autonomous self-directed agent away from his or her heroic quest to be a law unto himself or herself. When others are healthy and strong, 
Our moral lives, if we act well, have a kind of unnoticed grace because of the ease with which we can live amongst one another. But depending on how we engage those who are weak and suffering, the ease with which we ordinarily act, our moral character, can very easily turn into something like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace, a cheap morality that is fortunate enough never to be confronted by real need. On the other hand, when others are ill and weak, the character of our lives, if we act well, takes on a kind of deep and rich grace that penetrates to the very core of our existence as moral agents. Indeed, to act badly here is precisely to turn away from moral depth to moral superficiality, out of fear or selfishness or other forms of moral distraction and weakness. A bit of advice. One ought not to go to places like Calcutta if one is unprepared to face one's own moral super superficiality in the moral superficiality of the society one comes from. If I'm right about the depth of our moral character, we experience when we act well in the face of the suffering we encounter, then we move and advance toward human perfection the more we move towards those who suffer. So let's return to the healthy infants who are not persons on the social psychological criterion of personhood to see why we should begin to reject that notion of person wholesale. Notice <clears throat> that even if one said healthy human infants are not persons, no one would say that they are failed persons. We believe we have moral obligations to this class of human beings who do not count as social psychological persons. Despite what is implied by the social psychological criterion of the philosophers of killing, we can't kill them to satisfy our desires for a different child. We have to feed them. We have to clothe them. We have to shelter them. Why then do we have these obligations? <clears throat> The advocates of the social psychological notion of personhood will answer that we have these obligations precisely because they are healthy human infants who will develop <coughs> excuse me, into persons if everything goes according to plan. Human life, like all animal life, is dynamic and developmental. Calling these infant human beings healthy just marks the fact that they will become social psychological persons with some ordinary help from us. But this response is ad hoc and essentially gives up the game for the social psychological notion of person because it acknowledges that being a social psychological person is actually derivative upon something more fundamental than the ready capacity for cognitive and volitional acts. Being a social psychological person does not come from nowhere as if by metaphysical magic. It's a developmental stage in the life of a particular kind of animal, a human animal. So the moral obligations we have towards others who are healthy are not grounded in their being social psychological persons, but in their being human beings who are dependent upon one another even in health. However, if what I said about the depth and grace of the moral character of our lives as human beings is correct, we have to recognize that the moral obligations that we have toward one another, toward one another become deeper and greater insofar as we engage those, against, uh, those amongst us who are ill, impoverished, homeless, alone, cognitively and volitionally impaired in some way, and so on. We cannot understand these forms of suffering as forms of suffering, except insofar as we understand those involved to be human beings. The notion of illness is just as much grounded in the nature of what we are as human beings as is health. To be ill or suffering in some way is to be in a condition one ought not to be in given what one is, a human being rather than a bear, an earthworm, or a dolphin. An earthworm is not suffering because it cannot engage in cognitive activities. But a bear is suffering because it has a broken leg and cannot hunt for food. A human being suffers because she cannot but should be able to do what she is conceived and born to do. Much more is required of our moral depth in engaging her suffering than is required in engaging, in her, engaging her brother's health. That greater moral depth is required of us precisely because she's a human being just like her brother. 
again, the nature and depth of our moral obligations is more pressing in the face of illness than it is in health. These moral obligations are not grounded in the social psychological personhood of others, but in something more fundamental. They are grounded in the nature of being human against which health and illness are understood and measured. Now my point about the nature of moral depth in human life being greatest in the face of suffering is not confined to non-persistent suffering or illness. Consider a thought experiment. We're doing philosophy after all, it's just not going to involve any Martians. Suppose a human being from another planet arrived at the doorstep of a hospital and said, why are you earthlings so indifferent to the suffering of these people you say, you say are in a persistent vegetative state? And why, do you not, or and why do you want to kill them? We figured out how to cure that condition centuries ago. We'll show you how. It's easy. I think you'll agree that now enabled by this celestial visitor to cure those in a persistent vegetative state, we should provide such help to the human being who is in what is now a merely vegetative state. What this thought experiment suggests is not that you come to have moral obligations towards him or her because now you have a cure, that is that the obligation follows from the cure. On the contrary, it suggests that the obligation precedes the cure. The obligation to assist is already present even when you are not enable, in fact able to assist. It's an obligation toward human beings as such. Only such obligations toward human beings as such can make sense of the great moral character of our efforts to find cures for conditions we cannot yet cure. So, <clears throat> more generally, you have moral obligations towards human beings whose suffering you cannot, in fact, ameliorate or fix. Minimally, you have the obligation to care for them by abiding with them in their suffering. Suffering with them, adopting their suffering as your own. To adopt the suffering of another is your, as your own is literally what the term compassion means. Friendship is often described in its highest form as an adopting of the good of another as your own. However, as Thomas Aquinas argues, the nature of human friendship is such that you cannot adopt the good of, so the good of someone else as your own if you're not willing to adopt their suffering as well. There's no friendship where there's no compassion. And so Aquinas repeats for us Augustine's definition of mercy or misericordia. A suffering heart moved by compassion for those who suffer that acts to the extent possible to alleviate the suffering. But notice, even if one is unable to alleviate the suffering, misericordia, mercy, is still expressed in compassionate suffering with the one who suffers, abiding with them in their suffering. Here, a different, more defensible notion of person arises. A human person is an animal of a certain kind or nature ordinarily characterized by stages of development, including cognitive and volitional capacities displayed um, in various animal type activities. It is important to really realize, however, that for animals that develop over time, one can have a particular nature and yet one's capacity for pursuing what is otherwise an ordinary stage, stage of development uh, of that nature can be impaired or even absent. And just for a second, um, this is Helen, and her last name is slipping me now. She was the uh, first person euthanized in Germany under the T4 program, and she was euthanized against the will of her parents. Um, she had schizophrenia. And this is Fanny Lou Hamer who was a civil rights activist um, who protested the fact that she and many women, uh, African-American women in the South, were uh, involuntarily sterilized uh, when they would go in for ordinary procedures. Uh, she nicknamed it a Mississippi appendectomy. Um, she's a very famous uh, woman. Uh, for example, an ordinary characteristic activity of animals is to reproduce. My 12-year-old son, Tommy, is a living animal, despite the fact that he has not yet entered into the animal stage of development involving the ready capacity to reproduce. Noting that he cannot exhibit the capacity to reproduce, it would be absurd to deny that he is alive. 
despite the fact that the capacity to reproduce is generally a defining uh, capacity of living things. Just so, even if a human animal is impaired with respect to or even lacks the ready capacity to engage in rational and volitional activity, he or she remains a human animal, a human animal who is suffering. It follows from this fact that on this second and very different notion of a human person, that he or she remains a person, a member of the community of moral concern that cannot be killed. No human being can fail to be a person. That said, I do think that a human being can be a failed person. There's an ambiguity in my title. Think about it. To be a failed chess player, you first have to be a chess player. To be a failed musician, you have to be a musician. And to be a failed person, you first have to be a person. The ambiguity is between failing to be a person and failing as a person. Even if you can't fail to be a person, you can fail as a person. So how does a person fail as a person? One might be tempted to think that precisely because they are persons, those human beings who do not manifest the ready capacity for cognitive and volitional acts or for whom such capacities are severely injured or impaired are those who fail as persons. But that would be a mistake. Because human life is dynamic and developmental, success or failure as a person has to be understood with respect to the goals pursued by persons through their actions. Aristotle says that no position is so false there isn't an element of truth in it. And there's a minuscule element of truth in the social psychological notion of person, despite now having rejected it, I hope, as false. There are goals human beings pursue precisely because they are persons, walking to the store, making love to their wives or husbands, worshiping God. These are achievements that give expression to the reality of being a human person because they proceed from the capacity to understand the goals involved and to will to put in order into the pursuit of them. But if I'm prevented from, if I cannot bring reason and will to bear upon those goals for some reason, then I don't fail. I'm a person who for some reason cannot pursue the goals of a person. Would we say a chess player is a failed chess player if, for example, someone stole her board? or she was called away by the sickness of her child, or she was knocked unconscious. No. Similarly, the very young human being, the very old, the severely cognitively impaired, are all persons, but they are not failed persons, because precisely as persons, they are prevented, for various reasons, from acting and succeeding as persons. To fail as a person, you have to be able to act as a person and not be prevented from doing so. So who then might be failed persons? Well, unless you're Superman or Superwoman, we all fail as persons now and again. We all struggle, make mistakes, even if infrequently. But to answer that question with a little more depth than simply acknowledging our ordinary failures as persons, I want to focus upon one feature of the lives of human persons that is necessary to any success as persons. As I intimated above, it is almost impossible to think of any activity we engage in as persons that does not involve dependence upon other human beings for its accomplishment, however much its accomplishment may most properly belong to an individual. From the food we eat, to the disciplines we study, to the games we play, the sidewalks we walk upon, the wives and husbands we marry, to the children we raise, a clear-sighted vision of reality requires that we acknowledge our dependence upon others for what we achieve and for our success if we succeed. This feature of our lives can properly be described as a life of friendship and solidarity with one another. Friendship and solidarity precisely in our dependence upon one another in our weakness and our vulnerability, not despite it. If I'm right, just as we are persons because we are human, we are also friends because we are human. Being a friend to the human beings we encounter in life is no more a choice we make than is being a person. It is the condition of our lives. But who is my friend, you will ask? Who is my neighbor? The answer to those questions is not determined by our choice. We are conceived and born into human personhood, which just is to be conceived and born into human friendship. In fact, I'd like to say, but can't adequately defend here, that despite any difference of conceptual content, 
The nature of being a human person just is identical to the nature of being a friend. However, even though you cannot choose who your friends are, being a friend is something you can succeed or fail at because the friendship we are conceived for and born to finds expression through specifically human activity. So perhaps the most important question concerning success or failure as a person involves not how we act towards the friends we mistakenly believe we are free to choose to love, but the friends we are conceived and born to love. Moral and political reasoning that concludes to the possibility of killing the weak, the vulnerable and dependent, is moral reasoning that aims at the destruction of natural human friendship and solidarity. When we act to destroy the weak, the vulnerable and dependent among us, we act to destroy our friends. In so doing, we act to destroy the possibility of our success as persons. In a certain respect, when we act to kill other human beings, we act to kill ourselves. Yes, there are failed persons. Looking for such failed persons, we should not go looking among the very old and the severely impaired, the weak and the lame. We should look in the mirror and ask whether we see the face of a person who is a friend to these other persons, human persons, these other friends. The greatest, most successful human friendship is the friendship that gives the most help to those persons most in need because it has used its reason and will to acknowledge that it is already bound in compassion to these persons in their need, already bound to them by nature. My success as a human person is bound to those who suffer, bound to them as to my friends. In conclusion, when one looks in the mirror, one will only see a successful person if one has first learned to recognize the face of a person in one's natural friends, the weak, the vulnerable, the severely impaired, the suffering, all those friends who do not count as social psychological persons for much of contemporary philosophical and ethical thought. A failed person is a person whose face is not the face of compassion and mercy. Am I a failed person? Well, look at my face and tell me what you see. Do you see the face of mercy, the face of misericordia? If not, then I'm a failed person. Thank you for listening.